Hey, my name's Luis Antonio Perez. I'm the lead producer of Quien Are We? I'm just one of many people who help make this podcast. Representation is something that's extremely important to me, especially as a Latino creator. It's part of our shared mission in creating this show. You can help our mission by just taking a moment to give Quien Are We a rating or review on whatever podcast app you use. It really makes a difference in helping people find the show and elevating las voces lindas de nuestra gente latina. Thank you for supporting us and celebrating Latinidad with Colorado Public Radio. So my parents worked a ton. I would only see them for like a little bit of time. So my mom taught me to take care of the plants that she had. Okay. As a kid, it was more like practical necessity. So hmm. she was like, this is how you take care of my plants. And if I find out you're not watering them, you're getting the chancla. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> so it was practical. But, you know, I'm, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old. And I'm over here like taking care of the plants because like my mom's like sleeping, right? Like she got home like super late. Tired. So I'm like, all right, well, let's, let's <laughs> take care of these plants and hope I don't get the chancla. You know, I'm gonna kill all of these things. Yeah. Victor Sosa started raising plants pretty early on in his life, not because he wanted to, but because he had to. Fast forward to adulthood, Victor says plants rule everything in his life. But what makes someone go from doing boring housework reluctantly to putting their whole livelihood on the line doing that very same work? From Colorado Public Radio, this is Guillen Arwi. Exploring what it means to be Latine or Hispanic or Chicana or however you identify and diving into the beautiful things that make us who we are. I'm May Ortega. This time, we'll hear how a man turned a childhood chore into an adulthood revelation about himself and his community. There are a lot of pieces that make up this living puzzle of who we are. Some of Victor's include that he was born and raised in Denver, and he's a first-generation Mexican-American. Though he hasn't always thought of himself that way. I fully, fully like identify as like Mexican American, right? Uh, with like that stronger emphasis on like the Mexican part, mm -hmm. which wasn't always the case. It was a little bit confusing, right? Because of course, like my parents, I wouldn't say they're like super, super Mexican, right? But <laughs> we're over here eating like like organ meat tacos and stuff like that. Yeah. But I'm also going to like school with like. I was one of two brown kids in my elementary school and then same thing in my middle school and a couple in high school. So mm. I was in like a very white environment. And so I sort of just identified th that way. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> a culture that yeah, you're like in. that I'm in. Right. Yeah. All my friends are white, et cetera. Yeah. So I was like, I must be white. But like at home, I'm brown. Then he took a trip to Mexico City when he was on the cusp of adulthood. I felt at home, but I realized that the version that I had, even living here right, with my parents, super traditional, being of Mexican descent or pretty much any other Latin descent, I feel like when you go to the country of origin, if you're not expecting it, it catches you by surprise because like the food is different. The way they speak is different. So I just remember being there and I was like, I feel at home, but I realized that the version I had here was like the, the light version. Mm -hmm versus the real, the real deal. And that gave Victor some perspective. He was the real deal too. He began to look inward with kinder eyes and he gave more credence to the Mexican part of being Mexican American. He became less ashamed of who he wasn't and instead took pride in who he was and who he could be. And something else you should know about Victor is the fact that he's an only child, and he is very much aware of the pressures that come with that. 
first generation kid, you're supposed to like you get good grades and then you, you get a big boy job. Yeah. You, um, you make that good doing money. Doing something that you like, but the main thing is the good money. Yes. Right? Exactly. Make so. your parents proud. You want to do better than your parents yeah. did. Right. And you sort of, you feel like you owe it to them. Right. Yeah. And they never tell you like, hey, you owe me anything. Yeah. But the doing the opposite feels like it's like a slap in the face to your parents. Right. In pursuit of meeting those unspoken expectations, Victor earned not one, but two master's degrees. Then he used them to land a job as a data analyst. And it was pretty demanding. Like 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., six days a week demanding. He wasn't unhappy by any means, but this wasn't his passion. And after a few years, he was getting bored. It was one of those jobs where there was a lot of, like, hurry up and wait kind of thing. So I had a lot mm -hmm. of, I don't want to say downtime, but a lot of time where I didn't necessarily have to be, like, paying attention. Something to know about Victor is that he's always been entrepreneurial. I've always had this thing about, like, like selling things, right? So I was at my job, and I've had, like, Several other stances, like a like a reseller of things, right? So like, yeah. for like six months, I used to only sell like coffee mugs on eBay, right? Like collectible oh, coffee mugs, wow. like little things like that, yeah. right? And apparently, this habit of hustling runs in the family. When my grandmother was younger, she used to have all these like side gigs. So like, oh, she would okay. like go like to the market and like sell a couple things, even though like. She, same thing. She didn't have to, but she just thought it was fun. Like, so you get it from someone. <laughs> it's, in, it's in my blood <laughs> yeah, to like, be yeah. like, let's, let's sell hustles. some stuff. Right? Wow. Like, side hustles are my favorite thing. You yeah, know? that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. So Victor had a couple of hobbies. One of them was reselling things. And the other was going down rabbit holes into different topics. One such topic was plants, since he already had a bit of a history with them. He spent some of his downtime at work reading about different species, what conditions are suitable for which ones, things like that. Then, one day, these hobbies merged. I don't know if it's still around, but there used to be an app called Let Go. And it's basically like a secondhand reselling app for like local stuff. And I saw someone was selling plants, and I was like, that's so weird. <laughs> Like, this app is for couches and tchotchkes. This is not for plants. And I'm like, sure enough, it was a, a lady in Aurora that, like, had just posted. And I was like, that's strange, right? I was like, who's, yeah. don't you just get your plants at Home Depot or, like, the garden center or Yeah, something? like, we all do, right? Yeah. I was yeah. Like, what's this lady doing? And I just sort of put it in the back of my mind. But it was there, right? It was, like, lingering. So it lingered and lingered. He already had some knowledge on plants, and he was well-versed in reselling. So eventually, he decided to try it out himself. The first set of plants I posted, I very clearly remember it, it was one cactus arrangement, and then okay. four potted plants. Something like super basic, very simple. simple. Starter. Um, and yeah, it was yeah. like five things, and I just posted them. Uh -huh. right? And sure enough, you know, someone messaged me like right away. I remember it super clearly. Um, about the cactus arrangement, right? Mm. Um, and I was just like so jazzed. <laughs> I remember it was twenty dollars. These are like like two little cactus, on this in this like ceramic oval pot, and then to sweeten the pot, I put a little like resin garden gnome in it. I remember oh. it. I'll never forget it. And this lady was like, "Hey, I'm interested." Like, I think I had her like thirty bucks or something. She's like, "I'll give you 20 I was like, "Sold." <laughs> <laughs> Take like, it. Deal. <laughs> At first, this was just Victor's usual side hustle, only he traded selling mugs for houseplants. But in time, it got bigger. Victor started selling plants faster, buying, selling more and more. It started to creep into his workday. And you've told me that eventually you enlisted your parents' help in terms of space. So tell me about that. <laughs> enlisted, I don't think that is really the best word. I think forcibly volunteered is maybe um, the, the better way to put it. I'm posting things like at night or like on my lunch break. 
just any chance I could get, you know, I'm like taking pictures, posting them, selling these plants, making arrangements to have them get picked up. The pickup location for all these plants was my parents' house. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, so, you know, like, uh, I would just be like, hey, mom, such and such is going to come at 12 on Wednesday to pick up blank, right? So I'm storing these things in their house because I live in an apartment downtown this whole time. Yeah. I don't have the room for it. I'm storing more and more things in their house, more and more things in their house. And like, that's why I said like unwilling volunteers. So they have a three bedroom home. So she's like, just put all of it in the, in the bedroom, right? The one room that really didn't have anything. It was like a little office. All right. And I was like, oh, say no more, right? So yeah. of course you give me in this particular sense, you give me an inch, I take a foot. I put those on shelves on the wall, lined the entire bedroom. I took the desk out, took everything out. <laughs> That's so what I said. Like, a I took room. a foot. I, I took a foot. Yeah. Give me an inch. I took a foot. The matter of meeting up with a total stranger to buy or sell something can be a little nerve wracking, at least for me personally. And that's what Victor was doing having strangers come into his parents' house to grab their plants. And you would show up, I'd be like, oh, don't, don't worry. I promise you there's plants in there. Cause, <laughs> this isn't a trap. <laughs> yeah, this isn't a trap. We're both just standing on my parents' driveway, you know? So I did that for, for a long time when people would come into their house. My dad's over here watching TV. My mom's, like, cooking. There were several times where my dad asked the people, like, hey, like, we're about to sit down for dinner. Do you guys want some dinner? And I'm oh just my like, God. Dad, <laughs> trying to run a business here. <laughs> out Leave, of your house. Get out. This method of posting online continued for a couple of years. But something to keep in mind is that throughout this time, Victor was very aware that he was a brown man selling to a clientele of mostly white people, mostly white women. People who looked like him or even his mom were few and far between. But hey, Victor didn't discriminate. Eventually, he found himself setting up tents and tables in his parents' front yard on weekends, slinging plants left and right. It very much became a second job. By this point, the, the spare bedroom was two spare bedrooms that I'm using for the, the, the plant room, right? The quote-unquote plant room mm-hmm. is now all of a sudden two of their spare bedrooms. I got plants in their like guest bathroom. I got plants in my mom's kitchen. They're everywhere, oh, right? Man. It's becoming like unsustainable. Even though they were still willing to like let me continue to use their house, it was just not sustainable because the the business by this point, it was a full business, was expanding. So now my brain is like, well, as soon as it gets cold, I'm gonna have to move this whole operation back into my parents' house. And I was like, no, like it's time to you know put up or shut up. He had to choose between giving up the plant hustle or quitting his job. The very job that he shed tears for when he was hired. The job that helped him make his parents proud. And he'd be doing it to start his own business in a very competitive, very white market. That's after the break. Hey there. I'm Anna Campbell. And I'm Andrew Villegas. We both work as editors on Kian Are We? We are just two of the many people who help make this show. And we want Kian Are We to be a place to hear stories of Latino joy. It's the kind of show we always wanted to hear in our podcast feeds. So our team here at Colorado Public Radio made that show for you. If you care about these kinds of stories, there's an easy thing you can do to help. Take a moment and tell two friends about the show. That's it. Tell a friend or two. Thanks for listening and for helping to spread the word about Gen Are We. Victor Sosa had been selling plants out of his parents' house for a couple of years. Meanwhile, he was working a very busy job that meant a lot to him. So he had to pick one. He decided to quit his job. He went all in with plants. And with that choice came another. Keep selling out of his parents' home or move into his own space. 
And I don't mean his apartment. I mean a whole brick and mortar location, paying rent and everything. The thought of putting down thousands of dollars on this huge financial gamble was nerve wracking to say the least. The rent and everything, yeah. <laughs> nauseous just thinking about it. After weeks of searching and careful calculation, Victor eventually settled on the most affordable spot he could find around Denver. It happened to be in a pretty Latino area, Federal Boulevard. For context, Federal is where I go when I want tacos that remind me of home, or when I'm craving some tamarindo or gummy bears drowned in chamoy. Federal is the spot. And that is where Victor chose to be. And what did he choose to name his new business? Well, he thought it best to honor his humble beginnings. The name of the store came because it was just the bedroom and I would just walk through their entire house with whoever was there for the appointment. And I'd be like, the plant room's over here, the plant room's over here, and it's stuck. How are you doing? You doing okay, sir? Yeah, I'm Awesome. Good. Yeah, if you have any questions, just let us know. Yes, yeah. so I have this cafe medallion. Welcome to the plant room. Um, so your, your calathea needs a humidifier. It needs to live pretty much close to a humidifier that is on like 24-7. Yeah, just super high humidity. That's our great information. If it dies this time, at least I know why. Now, full disclosure, I do shop at the plant room every so often. The very first time I went in, I was met with plants, obviously. Cacti, succulents up by our windows. Uh, so all the syngoniums, arrowhead plants commonly known as. I do have a ficus shriveriana, a stanleyana, a ring of fire. They were packed into every inch of the space. And it wasn't very big, around maybe 500 square feet. Long, hanging vines crawled out of their pots and dangled over other shorter plants down the whole center of the shop. Shelves stuffed with smaller plants hugged the walls, and boy, was it humid. <laughs> it smelled so fresh and crisp in the shop, you could compare it to a forest in scent and appearance. But you don't usually find cumbia music in nature. I still remember that from my first visit because it made me feel seen. It was a pleasant surprise. And cumbia isn't on all the time. But when it is, it's great. Victor welcomed me in, not only on my first visit, but every visit after that. And if you have any questions about anything plant-related, Victor almost certainly has an answer. Around this room, how many plants would you estimate are in here right now? In, right, right now, probably around like three to four hundred. Uh, yeah, not not that many. Not right? that many. No, when it's fully, fully stocked, it can easily be a couple thousand plants in here. Wow! Oh my God. As Victor was making his way through the world of houseplants, he learned a few things about the plant trade in Denver. And one of them was about the demographics of his competition. Now it's now it's not like nothing that I think about, right? But initially it was something that I was very aware of. Most other shops are like female owned, right? Um, there's definitely, as far as I know, maybe I can think of like one now, maybe two now that are owned by like other men. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, 99% of them are female owned, mm -hmm. and white, right? So the space is predominantly like white. Um, mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I'm just, I'm this brown man over here like selling plants. One reason I kept going back to the plant room is because it's owned by a brown man. I even told him when we met that that was a rarity. The initial contact would be you come into the store and it's just me be standing behind the counter and I'm like, hey, you know, like if you have any questions, let me know. And if you're not expecting it, I feel like people that are in the hobby that go to plant stores, like if they're not expecting it, they're like, who's this guy, you know? Yeah. Um, very and interesting. very, very strange at first, right? Because I felt like people would look at me and maybe not even take me like a little bit seriously. Huh. Um, okay. You know, I'd be like, if you have any questions, let me know. I'm like, I know, you know, what I'm talking about, but I feel like sometimes people would be like, do you? 
<laughs> yeah. Do you, guy? Guy? <laughs> guy selling plants? Brown guy selling plants? Yeah. Um, so I'm over here just trying to convince people that I know what I'm talking about. Back then, hmm. I was very, very much aware of it. When I was doing the outdoor sales, I was very much aware of it. I wouldn't say it's something I had to like overcome yeah. necessarily in like a bad way, but it has been something that I've had to like sort of like push through and just be like, you know, like pushing through my narrative. When he opened his shop, Victor expected that his clientele would pretty much stay the same in terms of diversity, very white. But his location and his identity actually made way for another type of customer. Just like my mom was always into plants, pretty much everybody else's mom, I would say like, you know, other Mexican moms, other Latin moms are also into plants. So I started to get a lot of you know, like a lot of brown clientele in my shop because I was next to the Mexican restaurant. Nice. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm like, a, like I joked, I'm selling to everybody's abuelita. <laughs> and it was it was super, super important to me to not be disingenuous to that, to basically our community as well, um, because I unofficially became like the, the plan plug for, for the brown community here. Someone would come in from the Mexican restaurant next door and they're like, oh, I want to get some plants, but there's always, I feel like from talking to, to some of those people, there's always been like a hesitancy on their part hmm. to go get plants at plant shops. If you're, their English isn't good or if they're not mm. sure like w- really what they want, right? Because I still get a lot of this is my first plant type of, you know, mom and grandma. Sure, yeah. Um, it's intimidating. Yeah, I feel like they didn't really feel like super, super comfortable going there. So all of a sudden I have them coming into the shop. I feel like I could see my mom and I was just thinking like, oh, what would it be like for my mom to go into a plant shop and like maybe not feel like super comfortable or not feel like she could ask a bunch of questions. And all of a sudden, like now I'm here and I'm sort of providing that service. And yeah, it just it made me feel like a part of this of this community that when I was younger, I wasn't really connected to other than through my parents. Right. So my mom and my dad those are the only brown people really in my life. Yeah. And all of a sudden I have all these other people, right? So I have everybody's abuelita and <laughs> not, not, it makes me feel better, right? It makes me feel like not only is my business like a successful business, but it makes me feel like I'm in like a way giving back to like an underserved community, right? Because yeah. like I said, through talking to them, they, they want it, right? So they want plans. There's a demand. It's yeah. just a question of access. Access to them. And they're, the access is there, but I feel like the comfort is maybe not always there. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. A couple of years into opening the plant room, things were going pretty well. Victor had loyal customers, a successful business, so much so that eventually he was able to move into a bigger space. He could have gone almost anywhere that he liked. So he closed down his original location and chose a spot just a few blocks away, still on Federal Boulevard. Your first one, you know, you chose your first location out of convenience price, availability, all this stuff. Yeah. But the second one, you chose for other reasons. It was just important, right? So the first location on 23rd was next to a Mexican restaurant, right? A taqueria. So I not only had developed like a very, sort of like a very devoted clientele, mm-hmm. you know, predominantly white clientele. Mm-hmm. So it was important to stay there because of that, right? It felt disingenuous on my part to all of a sudden pick up the plant room and now that I can be choosy or move it somewhere else. As we said in the beginning of this conversation, you didn't feel super, super in part of your culture until you got older now. So how has that changed how you see yourself? I mean, now I think that's that's really the main way. Now I feel like a Mexican-American man mm. versus just feeling like a part-time Mexican and a part-time, mm. you know, white wannabe guy. Like, I am the plant poppy. Yeah. Um, the foliage father to some, but the plant poppy to, to another bunch of people. Yeah. And it has been the way in which I have felt like a Mexican-American man. So I'm super, super proud for, for many reasons, but that is something that I am very, like, it does make me feel warm and fuzzy inside that. <laughs> that I am a place where, like, people can come and, like, feel totally, like, welcomed. If you don't speak English doesn't matter i got you um like whatever we have to do that's great we'll we'll make it happen 
And Victor isn't the only one who's proud of all he's done. My parents are ecstatic, right? My dad always tells pretty much anybody that will listen, you know, that I sell plants. Same with my mom. I was very fortunate to do like a TV interview like a month or two back. Yeah, that's right. I remember saying that. Yeah. (laughs) Both my parents, I'm sitting at home. And both my parents, I get two separate text messages. They had both recorded it with their phones <laughs> and both had like texted me the little video. And we're just like, we're just so proud of you. Oh um, my gosh. Yeah. So my parents have always been like my biggest support base. Right. But again, it's one of those things where my dad is just like, whatever I do, my dad's like, woo, you know, he's like a, yeah. my biggest cheerleader. <laughs> my mom has always supported me. And so she's always been sort of like in the background of whatever I'm doing. So she's like super stoked. Like you said, you've, you've seen her at the shop. Yeah. Right? She's she, always, yeah. Several times I've met your mom. Now she's like a willing participant. She was an unwilling <laughs> participant. Now she's a willing participant. I guess he was able to avoid getting the chancla after all. Victor Sosa is the founder and owner of The Plant Room in Denver, Colorado. He's actually preparing to open another location in Denver sometime soon. Thank you to Victor for sharing his journey of entrepreneurship and self-discovery with us. I'm May Ortega. This episode was produced by me, with mixing by Rebecca Romberg. It was edited by Aaron Jones and Andrew Viegas. Pedro Lumbrano wrote our theme music. You can find a list of everybody who helped make this episode in the show notes. Quien Are We is a production of Colorado Public Radio.